Welcome back to Differential Equations. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the method of characteristics, which is perhaps the most important tool that we're going to talk about in this course for solving differential equations. Let me get my head out of the way and let's dive right into that. The method of characteristics is a tool for solving a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. Or technically speaking, we can use this same process for third order, fourth order, or any higher order differential equation. We're going to stick mostly to second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients. So we're looking at some y double prime of t, some y prime of t, and some y of t. We have some constants a, b, and c fitting in amongst them, and we're setting it equal to zero. At first glance, that probably feels incredibly restrictive. Compared to separable differential equations are compared to first order linear differential equations. Second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients is incredibly restrictive. But there's a very important example that uses these. And that example is Newton's second law, F equals MA. I showed you previously that that's a second order differential equation. Um, acceleration is a function or the derivative of a function of position, the second derivative. Forces generally will change depending on where you are, but it's not very common to analyze forces that change over time. And so there's a lot of work with Newton's second law that can be written as a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. In fact, that's where I first really started to understand differential equations was when I took a course on Newtonian mechanics and we just dug into how to use uh, Newton's law to form differential equations to use that to solve problems. I'll show you a little bit of that in this course but for now, let's just focus on the method and keep in the back of our minds, there is a key example as to why these are so important. As we've looked at differential equations, as we looked at separable equations, as we looked at first order equations, we've seen a lot of situations where y equals e to the k times x shows up as a solution. For reasons that are going to become very apparent, oops, that's more than I wanted to erase. For reasons that are going to become very apparent when we start getting into the applications, using the letter k here is problematic. Uh, we've used mu as an arbitrary constant, and that's unfortunately also going to be problematic because we're actually going to tie this into first order equations in a couple of ways later on in the course. And so we need some other variable. I've seen R used here. I've seen Z used here. My favorite though is to steal a random character out of the Greek alphabet. It is the lowercase Greek letter Z, spelled X-I. And it's a loop and a loop and a curly tail. I'll generally just call it squiggle and I'll write it like that. But it's the random squiggle that shows up in exponentials when you're playing around with things. All right, so my solutions, I'm just assuming that y equals e to the c times x should prove to be a solution to this differential equation. 
right? Well, if that is my function y, then I get that y prime is squiggle times e to the squiggle x, and y double prime is going to be squiggle squared times e to the squiggle x. And plugging that into my differential equation, I have a times squiggle squared times e to the squiggle x plus b times squiggle times e to the squiggle x plus c times e to the squiggle x equals zero. And there is a common factor of e to the c times x in each of these three terms. We can factor it out and then we can use the zero product rule. So we get that either a times c squared plus b times c plus c is equal to zero or e to the squiggle times x is equal to zero. And if there's one thing we know about the exponential function, it's that it has an asymptote at y equals zero. There is never a value of x that you can plug in and get that e to the something times x is equal to zero. It just never happens. e raised to some number, positive, negative, or zero, always gives you a positive result out. Never zero, never anything negative. And so, that was supposed to be in a blue highlight color. And so this is our solution. We have here a quadratic equation in C. If we can solve this quadratic equation, then we know the value of C that satisfies the assumption that we started with, right? We assumed that there was some value of xi up here so that y equals e to the xi times x was a solution to our differential equation. And what we found from that assumption was, sure, it's there, it satisfies this quadratic polynomial equation. And so that will give us a specific solution. And it's even better than that because we started with a second order linear differential equation. And we saw previously that if you have a second order linear differential equation and you have two linearly independent solutions, that every other solution can be written as a linear combination of those solutions. And this is a quadratic equation. And you know from algebra that a quadratic equation has two solutions. So we'll have e to the something times x, we'll have e to the something else times x, and we've seen that when you have e to two different powers times x, you have two linearly independent functions. And so we take our differential equation, we turn it into this thing, which we are now going to name and call the characteristic equation. We solve, we find the values of C that work. We write two functions using those as our two exponentials and we have our solution. All right, let me get my head back out of the way and let's see how that works in action. All right, so here is a relatively straightforward differential equation. y double prime plus 5y prime minus 6y is equal to zero. 
Since we see that this is a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients, right? It is second order, it has y double prime, y prime and y. It is linear, those things are by themselves and not interacting with each other and nothing is happening to them except multiplying by something. And the coefficients are constant, the right-hand side is zero. Those are all of the characteristics that we need to say that this is a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. And so we can immediately jump to the characteristic equation. Two ways to think about this, which give you the exact same result, they're entirely mnemonic devices. Take the coefficient on y prime, which in this case is one, and multiply it by c squared. Or alternately, replace y double prime with c squared. Replace y prime, with C and replace Y with, well, nothing, a constant one. And you turn this thing from the uh, differential equation to the polynomial equation. And you can, fa uh, you can solve the differential equation by solving the quadratic equation either by factoring or by using uh, the quadratic formula if you can't see how to factor it. If it's a higher order differential equation, uh, the quadratic formula obviously no longer works, but you know, factoring a cubic or a fourth uh, degree polynomial is technically something you should know how to do. Uh, in this case, factoring is relatively simple. We need two numbers that multiply to negative six and add to positive five. So positive six and negative one seem to work very nicely, which gives us the solution either C equals negative six or C equals one. That in turn, I'm going to try to put this over here because I want to leave the differential equation on the screen for a little bit. The first solution for C, uh, negative six, corresponds to a function y1 of t equals e to the negative six t. The second solution corresponds to a solution to the differential equation, y2 of t equals e to the one times t. And in general, if we take a linear combination, some constant c1 times e to the negative 6t plus some other constant c2 times e to the t, that is our general solution to the differential equation. Yeah, that's it. If you are not feeling entirely confident, I encourage you to take a few minutes um, differentiate this solution we've gotten. Take the first derivative, it's going to be negative six C1 e to the T plus C2 e to the T. Take the second derivative, which will be 36 C1 e to the negative six T plus C2 e to the T. Plug those things into the original differential equation, uh, combine your like terms, realize that everything cancels out and you are left exactly where you thought you would be um, with zero equals zero. We can make this a little bit harder on ourselves. We can end up with some um, equations that don't factor nicely. For example, y double prime minus four y prime minus seven y equals zero. We can again write our characteristic equation, which is going to be c squared minus four c minus seven. Again, the mnemonic I remember 
replace y double prime with xi squared, replace y prime with xi, replace y with xi to the zero or just one, right? Replace each of your functions with xi raised to the power, that is the number of derivatives you took. That's not what we're actually doing. We, what we actually do, I showed you on a full page, but we're just remembering the result and a convenient mnemonic device to help us get there. All right. To factor this, I would need two numbers that multiply to negative seven and add to negative four, which I'm fairly confident are not integers and probably not fractions either. So in this case, I'm going to go to the quadratic formula. It's a little bit weird solving for C instead of X in the quadratic formula, but you've done enough quadratic equations in your life that hopefully it's not too bad. X or C in this case equals the opposite of B, opposite of negative four is positive four, plus or minus the square root of B squared, negative four squared is 16, minus four, times a, which is one, times c, which is negative seven. Four times negative seven is negative 28. We have subtraction already, so let's just change that to addition and put in our 28, all over two times a, which is, well, still one. All right, you can use a calculator if you have one. I don't, so I'm going to try to work through this by hand as best as I can. Uh, 16 plus 28 is 44. And of course, 44 is four times 11, so we can reduce that radical. The square root of four is two, the square root of 11 is square root of 11. And then we can reduce the fraction by realizing that four divided by two is two, and two root 11 divided by two is, well, root 11 and we get that C is two plus or minus root 11. This gives us a really ugly looking result, but it is still a result and that's what really matters. I get that y1 of t is e to the 2 plus root 11 times t, and y2 of t is e to the 2 minus root 11 times t. Right. It's ugly, but it works, and that's all we care about. And then, of course, the general solution, y of t, is equal to some constant c1 times the first function. And there we have it. Right. I'm going to look at one more problem or a problem for you to look at to wrap up this video. But before I wrap up, I do want to mention, if you think about the situations you've dealt with in algebra courses when it comes to solving quadratic equations, you know that depending on the specific parameters, depending on the values of the coefficients, a quadratic equation can have two real roots, which is the situation we've been dealing with. It can have a repeated root, or it can have two complex conjugate roots. In the next couple of videos, I'm going to deal with those other two cases because what we're doing absolutely does work, but exponentials with complex numbers going on is a little bit messy. And if you have repeated roots, then all of a sudden our two linearly independent solutions are no longer linearly independent. So we need to develop a few more tools for dealing with those things. And we'll be doing that in the next few videos. For today though, I want to wrap up with a problem like this for you to try on your own, a little bit more involved than the ones that I've just solved. Um, these start to get lengthy and uh, fitting all of the problems into the video is uh, a little bit painful by the end of the course.
Great. But I want you to take a look at this initial value problem. Let's make that zero look like a zero. Right. We have the differential equation, y double prime plus 7y prime plus 12y equals zero. And we have two initial conditions, y of zero equals zero, y prime of zero equals negative one. I would like you to take a few minutes and work through the solution to this initial value problem, see where you end up, and I'll see you in the next video.